trying to rise to their levels. You know, I have to look at every single thing that we do. I guess, you know, to bring it back around to our discussion, you know, incorporating student voice is a big piece of that, you know. Finding out from kids, how did this go? How did this work? You know, and, and, uh, and valuing and using, and using their points of view. But I, I think one of the things we keep saying, you have to teach them how to even break out of that paradigm and convince them, yeah, I really want to know. I really want to know what you think would make this work better. Yeah, because this has been like an adventure for connected educators and ed campers, I think, over the last couple of years. We're learning as we go, and we're embracing it, and we're realizing the benefits of it, but we're a very small group. And how do, how do you affect the masses, number one, as adults, and then number two, how do you trickle that down to yeah. students? It's a big piece of what I want to talk about in, that se in our afternoon yeah. session about how, we, as leaders, we could do that, right? and everybody can take that leadership role. Because again, we really are in the infancy stage. Well, here, here's a question then. When you talk about student voice, is it somebody sitting in your classroom talking right at you, or is it their blog, or their whatever? Do you need to pay attention to the other things that they have available for them? Right. How many started hiring teachers who hated school? That's your new question for your next interview process. Did you like school? The teacher says yes. They're going to reproduce what they went through. And you're not going to know of what other things are actually out there. If you hire a teacher who says no, you know that you're gonna get a person in the classroom who's gonna go out of their way to hit the other 90% of kids who don't want to be there. I know, and our profession is so stilted to its people who are just great at school. Well, yeah, isn't that, I mean, that's why you go into education. Yeah. I mean, I would think most people would be like, so I, I, I like education, I yeah. like it. <coughs> I wouldn't stay there forever. I, I became a teacher to make school better because I hated it. And I hated okay. middle school, so it was the worst that's three years of my existence. <laughs> I started teaching sixth and seventh grade because I was like, I'm gonna make this better for you. And I, um, my school has a coaching class, which is like an hour every morning where I have 25 of the same kids and I follow them through. Um, and so I basically get an hour of guidance, advisement with them. And uh, that's all I work on, just trying to make school, like middle school less horrible. Uh, right. <laughs> and like loving yourself and dealing with all the things that come with being 13. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't fall into traps because I, I, don't, I don't even remember most of it. People are like, oh, well, when I was in school, right. I learned it this way. I'm like, I have no right. recollection of any of that. I'll probably suppress it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What That's you going to say? Go ahead. I interviewed a woman last week or the week before who, she was great interview. She was doing a great job. And I asked her a question about her professional learning and a book she had recently read. She was talking about Teach Like a Pirate. And, you know, Bell went off. I kind of started paying attention. And I said, tell me how you found the book. And she was like dancing, you know. Well, I, well, I, I Googled it. I, you know, like, nobody finds Teach Like a Pirate unless you're on Twitter. You're kind of, like, just say it. And I'm like, Googled it? What do you mean? You, really? That's how you found it? Like, say Twitter to me, and I'm, I'm going to give you a second minute to say it. She was so <laughs> afraid to say it that she was on Twitter, and she was connected. She, you know, she didn't know the room. People are not talking about being a connected educator, I swear, I had to literally, you know, like pull it out of her. I almost had to get up and shake her to say Twitter. Finally, she was like, well, I do these chats online. <laughs> I'm like, are you talking about Twitter? She's like, yes. I'm like, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, the whole room was laughing. All the teachers were laughing. I'm like, we're connected here. It's OK. Like, it was like a dirty word for her. But, yeah. The fact that, that that's even a, that and, and I think that's pervasive. I think that's one more. teacher. Yeah. All the people I've been in, and I'm sitting on like 17 of the big cities at this point, you can imagine. One, one connected educator. I have come up with. Yeah. But I, I, I think that's problematic too, because on interview committees, that's one of my standard questions now is are you a connected educator? How do you learn? You know, what vehicles do you use to learn? And you're right. I don't know if it's that there aren't as many as we want, as many young people in the profession using it, or if it's a dirty word. And we haven't given them permission yet to say, this is actually the preferred vehicle or method of learning. Right. Because it's what, it's what Don was just speaking to. At one point in time, his learning network was five principals in a district that he met once a month. Right. Now it's tens of thousands of you know, caring, educated, enthusiastic professionals that go on Twitter every night to learn and teach and grow with one another. And I, I thought it was eloquent what Don said. It's like, how can he not 
reevaluate all of the things he does to rise to the level of people that are doing things now that he has the exposure to see it. It's it's fascinating you when can't. you think about it. I did ask her on the way to find on the way out to find me on Twitter. She hadn't yet. <laughs> so how do people respond at, um, at interviews? Sure how do they respond when you ask them that question? And how how is your interview committee affected by it? Well, that's a good question, too, because not everybody, at least in my district, is drinking the Connected Educator Kool-Aid yet. Um, so that's, that's a challenge in and of itself. So some people think, oh, that's, that's Dan's thing. You know, you get one of those. And then the people who are invested who get it are interested into hearing what the candidate has to say. And then the candidate is caught in this in this vortex of, well, you know, when you're a candidate on an interview committee, you're trying to take the cues of the audience. So if you get bad body language from some people and then good body language from some, you're trying to tailor your response to the person who asked the question without alienating the other people sitting at the table. So it's, again, it's education being our own worst enemy. Well, then I think if you take a step backwards to the candidates, you know, are we, are our teaching programs, how are they evolving? You know, is the program that I went through, how much has that evolved since I was first trained? You know, are we training our candidates to drink the Kool-Aid? You know, so that when they show up to the interview, that's, you know, they're prepared for what what we're looking for. You know, I mean, I'm curious what's happening in our teacher prep programs, because I don't have yeah, experience. Very, I'm sure it's very, very varied. Because but I how, how do we get them on board with what, the conversations exactly. that we're having? How do we... I won't say anything. I think, but going back, <laughs> I'm one of those people force feeding the Kool Aid. Okay. And uh, is a you're amazing. spiking the Kool Aid, Paul. <laughs> I mean, you said, I did it, Paul. You're spiking the Kool Aid. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people at the you know undergrad or grad level who are serving the Kool Aid who have never tasted it themselves. I know that's mm -hmm. for a fact. Okay. You figure it's someone like myself who has you know been drinking it for years. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It would just I would just assume that if I got up in front of a bunch of people who had a whole lot less experience, and I'm all excited, and I'm talking about the person I've become because of it, well then people would just want to start guzzling, right. you know? <laughs> and it is amazing how that's, I mean, I wish I kept better statistics of what percentage of people stayed on after leaving class, mm -hmm. you know, because it's a part of the class requirement. Sure. Uh, and it's an amazing, it just that's a very small, low number, um, and so, because of that, you know, I started thinking, well, right, so what are all the reasons why they stop? Mm -hmm. And I think time is actually a legitimate thing. I think anybody who pushes being connected will always say, well, you would open up time, you make time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, in my own life, I mean, it's it's a forced thing to get it in. Sure. Yeah. So if your minutes are already scheduled, especially if you're in that zone of having a family and everything else. Um, right. so what? The schedule 15 minutes, just go on Twitter. Yeah, or it's still, I think, easier said I, I've been really looking at it this year as I changed and got a new teaching position and I've had less time because of more prep. And it's, it's 15 minutes this year has been a real struggle. Um, shoot, there was something else I was going through. I read a really